Welcome to the Woman Energy Podcast on Real Practical Shamanism with me, Joseph Sykora and Damon Smith. And we're here, as always, to talk about shamanism from the ground up. So we haven't had an episode in a while, and we realised, Damon and me, that we haven't actually done an episode on the term woven energy before. So we thought it'd be a really good idea to kind of dive into that term, what it means in the context of a few different things, the shaman's drum, the spirit dance, stage four, all of that good stuff. So Damon, how are you doing? I'm very good, mate. How are you? I'm all right. I'm down with the lurgy, but uh, nothing that's going to stop <laughs> us getting this episode done. So, um, so yeah. Uh, have we got any patrons to thank? Patrons, oh, new patrons. Do we ever? Do we ever? So it's been a know, while, hasn't it? We always have. We always have our patrons to thank. I mean, there's there's two waves of thanking here. One is all of the patrons. I won't list you guys out. You know who you are. Uh, and and the people in Patreon will be finding out who you are soon because we we actually recorded a gathering of the tribe. So I want to thank all of the the patrons who made gathering of the tribe a success this year. Uh, it wasn't advertised very well by me, so I, I accept full responsibility for that. Uh, it went shockingly well considering how little preparation was done for it and how. Uh, well, you've been very, very busy, haven't you? And uh, so yeah. have I, really. But continue, um, continue there we go. to be, yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, so I'm not sure exactly how far we go back, but I think I've got, I've eventually figured out how to use what's known as the relationship manager inside Patreon. Right. Um, but anyway, so the new patrons, so the, so the patrons who joined Gathering of the Tribe, everybody's going to know who they were because they're on the recordings, which are appearing gradually in the in the patrons area. Uh, so thanks, guys. Uh, but also relatively new patrons. So let's go from Gabriel Sims Fewer, uh, Matt Johnson, Richard Ball, Marty Wild, Danny Lee, John, Athena, John Blagden, and CM. Fantastic new patrons. Thanks ever so much, guys. Uh, yeah, very thank you much so appreciated. Much. Very much appreciated. Yeah, and remember, you can go to patreon.com slash woven energy if you want to uh, support us over there. Um, so. Thank you so much. What so gathering of the tribe then? Do you want to do you want to kick things off by talking a little bit about the about how that went about the gathering of the tribe? So yeah, so just like the year before, we did a week, a full week of sessions. That's one one session a day. Each session was between, I guess, about an hour and two hours, something like that. And we did a different topic every day. So we did an introductory lecture about the use of sound in shamanism. We was looked, the overarching theme this year the drum. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. So I mean, the overarching theme every year is shamanism, and it's just like taking a different slant on it, different way to look at it. So the year before Gathering of the Tribe twenty three, that was all about spirit dance and how you can use yeah. spirit dance to to kind of understand shamanic technique in general. And and so this year was the drum taking the same kind of thing. Next year, there's a bunch of ideas about what we might do next year. So we'll we'll have to wait and see what we're going to do. Gathering of the Tribe 25. But the recordings of the episodes are appearing. I think there's about three of them in, two or three of them in Patreon already. We actually recorded a, a patrons podcast. So that's a bunch of the patrons got together uh, at Gathering of the Tribe 24 and recorded a podcast, which is which will be a first for our channel. Nice. And uh, we'll be releasing that on this channel. Uh, soon, I'm not sure whether it will go out before or after this episode. Just have to see what um, what time I get to edit that. But yeah, and that that was fantastic, and that was really interesting and went very well. It was a kind of cute question and answer session around the drum. And um, cool, but yeah. So so basically, we did an introductory lecture about the use of sound in shamanism, and then we did a couple of, of lectures, not lectures, workshops uh, using the drum drum technique, a basic shamanic technique uh, at different levels. So we did sort of cellisty technique and we did uh, Amska technique and we did some level three technique as well. And then me being me, we had a couple of sessions on using the drum in shamanism. Um, and then we had an additional session on, uh, sorry, using the drum in shamanism using spirit dance with the drum so that's that's not using the drum as an accompaniment to spirit dance as you might see but actually using the drum as part of the dance and then we had uh one session on specialized drum techniques and then the final session was this thing that i'm talking about this sort of 
Q and A session come podcast that the patrons uh, that that were able to make it uh, contributed it to, which was wonderful. So thanks to everybody who contributed to that. You, like I say, you'll see them in the patrons. Actually, you'll hear from them on the main podcast because they're all going to be on it. And um, and yeah, so it was it was a nice counterpart to Gathering of the Tribe twenty three. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to 24. And hopefully I and Joe and myself will be able to promote Gathering of the Tribe 24 a bit better than we did, sorry, 25, a bit better than we did 24. Um, and so hopefully more people will know about it. I think it was a bit short notice for a lot of people, but we um, we did get a decent, fairly decent turnout despite that. So thanks, guys. Good. Excellent. Um Okay, so because uh, we've been we've been in touch over the past week about what we wanted to talk about today, mm-hmm. and um, you would, you uh, you had the idea to essentially talk about the term woven energy. Yeah, uh, we've called the podcast the woven energy podcast, um, but we've we've never really done an episode diving into what that means. We've I think I believe we've talked sure. about well, it now we again, and yeah. you've, you've you've done little bits and bats on it, but not really a deep dive into what it actually means. So. That's um, right. So perhaps you can kick things off with just an overview of what the term woven energy actually means. And, and why we picked it. So yeah, yeah. The, um, what a shaman sees when they see the world through their training, through their discipline, through their years of engagement with nature is a little different from what you might say the average uh, person, average member of a, certainly of a settled civilized uh, society sees there are many different lenses through which the world can be viewed and i think certainly in western civilization and to us to a certain extent eastern civilization as well we have a, a view of what i might call compartmental compartmentalization in our vision of the world our societies tend to compartmentalize things they tend to as we've said before put things in little boxes and we also have a fairly materialistic view of the world. Uh, people in the East often criticize Westerners as being overly materialistic. But actually, from what I've seen in the East, it, it's also true that, that everybody in these things that we call civilizations or countries or whatever you want to call it, these kind of ordered societies that we've invented in the last five to 10,000 years, Everybody sees the world in a fairly materialistic way, but I don't mean materialistic in terms of, I'm not talking about greed around wealth and, you know, capitalism and, you know, the the acquisition of things being the, a, a an objective in life. That, that's not really what I'm talking about here. What I mean by materialism is we, we have this sense of matter, of material things, of objects, of uh, things that are solid. So we have this idea of solids, liquids, and gases. Uh, There's a a bottle of water has a liquid in it. The bottle is a solid. Uh, My computer is a solid, largely. um, And the air I'm breathing is a gas. This is what I mean by a materialistic view of the world, a way to see things. But when you experience shamanic technique, certainly over a period of time, when you experience nature... Another kind of way to view the world emerges out of your chalicity practice. Is that if you want to know what chalicity is, you need to wind back to the start of the podcast and, you know, episode one, start moving forwards. Another way to view the world, which is that the world is not a static thing, it's not a collection of static objects. Everything in the world is, has an interrelationship with everything else in the world and everything in the world is constantly changing and what we mean by a thing also changes from a kind of you know like if you if you imagine a a cube like a cube made out of I don't know ceramic or wood or some other kind of material we kind of grow to understand that as a thing we tend not, you know, a rock is a really good example, isn't it? A rock, you put, if I was to put a rock on my desk and look at it I, as, a, as a civilized, uh, settled person with a, 
materialistic education behind me, I see it as a rock. It's a rock object is what's what's there on my desk. But as a shaman, through your training, you start to perceive these things very differently. Suddenly through your Chalisi training, your Amska training, level three, level four, especially when you get at level four training, which is what a lot of the recent Woven Energy episodes have been about, you see it much increasingly less as a static object and increasingly more as a pattern of change. And even the fact that something isn't changed, changing, as we've said, is actually a change. And my personal experience of this, going through these years and years of learning to be a shaman, learning about shamanism, learning about nature, uh, through a participation within nature, I don't see things as things like I used to when I was maybe 18 years old. I see them as patterns, as patterns of energy, as ongoing echoes of a eternal energy change that comes down through time, comes down through the generations um, from a distant beginning, from a remote beginning to a far distant end point, a dwell point somewhere in, there in the future. And we're sort of not... We're not flying around in my perception anymore. We're not flying around in a random collection of objects or a non-random collection of objects. What instead is happening is that there is a thread or many, many threads that come down from that beginning, from the beginning of the universe. These threads run not just through space, but they also run through time. And they intersect with each other, they cross over each other, and they constantly change in many, many different ways. They are threads of energy. They constantly change in many, many different ways. And what you might see in in your room, like the rock on your desk, if you've got a decorative rock on your desk, like a paperweight or something like that, you see a point on that energy thread that is the life of that rock in the universe. But actually, if you were to trace that point on a time axis, um, also on a space axis, but on a time axis, it wouldn't be a point, it would be a line, a thread. And it's these threads of energy which is not the only way that energy is expressed in the universe, but it's the most common way. These threads of energy that come down from that beginning, from the intersecting principles that were at play in the beginning, and those threads echo down through time. And we are caught up in a weave of those threads. And they form everything that we see. They form everything that we hear. They form everything that we feel everything that we perceive through our senses, they form all of that. And so when a shaman sees a beautiful valley, for instance, they tend to see energy patterns. They tend to see a weave of energy. And they tend increasingly less as time goes by, I found, increasingly less see what people might describe as things. Um, I, I am coming to the point in my life, you know, I started studying shamanism when I was about 18, and I'm now 57, so it's a fair old amount of time in between, but I'm coming to the point in my life where I'm not entirely sure that things, that there are things, what, what I used to think of as things when I was young, um, I'm not entirely sure that those things are actually what I thought they were. They're, they're an expression or like a freeze frame or a snapshot. Of course, it never actually is a snapshot because we're riding the bow wave of this change, aren't we? If there's a constant change going on in the universe. But yeah. those things are not much less thingy to make a, a not exactly a good armabella word, is it? But they're much more patterny, energy patterny. They're, they are expressions of these threads intersecting with each other and um, uh, forming the manifest world that we experience. And we, like, as I said, we're on the bow wave of that ongoing change uh, that is okay. extending back into the past and into the future simultaneously. 
This is like a shamanic perception. It's like deconstructing the mind's natural um, uh, desire to categorize, right? So when we're kids, we, we try to put everything in boxes. And then as we grow older, mm. shaman, yes. it sounds like shamanism, one of the things that shamanism does for you is it, uh, it, it kind of teaches you to declassify things. That it, that's definitely part of it, but it, there's a bit more to it than that. There's also, you learn the thing, or you, it's not so much you learn it, because you're learning with your, your body, aren't you? You're learning with your perception. You're learning with your holistic action, that, you know, the holistic action of the human body interacting with nature, That we, these things that we call shamanic technique. It, it is decategorizing for sure, but also the life of things the the alpha and the omega the the extension of those threads back into the far distant past and out into the far distant future are perceived much more in the here and now through shamanic technique than they are through non shamanic technique. You, you see, see that things leads me, that leads me to all another time. to my other thought, which is that what you're describing sounds very much like um, animism. Um, mm-hmm. So it'd be great to to hear what you think about. Uh, the difference between the shamanic perspective and the animism and the and from the animism sure. perspective, sure. So, like everything has a life. Everything has a life force. You hear this in Hinduism all the time. Everything uh-huh. has a has a life. Everything's connected. Every single object. Um, that's why there's millions and millions and infinite number of gods in Hinduism because there's a, there's a, everything Absolutely. has a god <laughs> in it. So obviously yeah. that stuff has roots in um, in shamanism, uh, yeah, which absolutely. I find fascinating. And the, but, yeah. these, Nature religions like Hinduism, like Shinto, they have their origins in shamanism in, in, in a, to a certain extent. All religions have origins in shamanism, even the really, really command and control ones, because they tended to, the command and control religions, the religions of a book, if you like, those ones, they were often invented originally, originally by shamans at the behest of the command and control tribal leaders, because the shamans were the guys who were creative and able to come up with that kind of nonsense, you know. Yeah. So, so yes, the um, the the shamanistic aspect and the animistic aspect are like two sides of the same coin, aren't they? Animism is, to me. I mean, you, you know, these are academic terms, so I'm kind of redefining them to a certain extent. But animism to me is a human being becoming natural, going yeah. back to reverting to a natural state, reverting to the state that we were in for the vast majority of our evolution, you know, 2 million years versus 10,000 years since we invented this civilization thing. Uh, the the 10,000 years, although it's had a huge impact on us in the 20th century, 21st century, this kind of uh, time period, actually, it's a tiny drop in the ocean compared to the entire existence of human beings when we were in the other state, we are in the animistic state. And that idea of there being infinite gods is, is part of the idea that in tribal societies, it's very easy when they start to become a bit more miasmatic they, it's, and they start inventing their own religions it, it's very easy to take the idea of an aspect of nature, a river, mountain, the wind, the sea, and anthropomorphize it into a god, if you like, into something yeah. to be worshipped. Because shamans do have a reverence for nature, right? I have a huge reverence for nature. And I love the wind, and I love the trees, and I love the mountains, and I love the... To the point where I become the sea, especially, you know, I become reverential towards them. I'm becoming, I, I feel very, very grateful for the experience that they've given me as a shaman. Uh, and, you know, that can be, start to trend towards a, a kind of religious reverence, a religious awe of the power of nature. And I see, that's where I see animism, this idea that there are, if you think of the idea of a god originally, originally just simply becoming being a aspect or principle of the underlying essence of nature that gets in somebody's minds or in a group of people's minds gets anthropomorphized into a god, uh, and then that god is, you know, we make some offerings to the god. Thank you very much, god of the wind, for the wonderful experience you've given us in our spirit dance. 
up among the stone circles. You know? um, yeah, that, that's kind of what that's how animism goes. And it's not just in Hinduism where there's this myriad, this idea of the myriad gods. You get that in, in Yoshida Kanatomo's stuff. And he was the guy that tried to take Shinto back to its shamanistic roots. And he called it the Yao Yorozuno Kami, which means basically the myriad Kami. All of the Kami were really like one Kami. And this is where, for a shaman, this sort of, you know, debate that you get in theology, theologians uh, have this debate about is it is monotheism an advance on polytheism, like as if it's some sort of progressive step forwards, um, when really it's just arguing over things that are going on in people's heads. It's all in <laughs> your head. Um, and actually, Kanatomo was not um, saying that all of these gods have ceased to exist and now there's one god, Taigen Sanjin. He was not saying that at all. He was saying there are aspects of the same underlying energy patterns that are there at all times and have been since the beginning and will be to the end. This ongoing pattern of energy change. And seeing the pattern, the pattern of change within nature, of which these various episodes we've been doing recently, a level four technique, we're talking about different commonly occurring aspects of the changes that go on within that energy pattern. You can see it, Miki, for instance, she she described it as the divine orchestra, the kagura. Uh, the the different principles that went on in the creation were like musical instruments, and they had um, interactions with each other. The changes that they made interacted with each, with each other in various harmonious ways or non harmonious ways, and they created echoes down through the generations that have extended all the way down through the generations from the beginning of the universe, and the, those changes that happened at that point in time, they're not here now, but the echoes are. And the echoes are the world that we perceive, the manifest world, the middle realm, if you want to talk about it, in terms of the world tree, the trunk of the tree. That manifest world is, is nothing other than the echoes, the energetic echoes of those instruments. And this is why drums are so popular in shamanism, because when you practice your level three, level four, level five technique, even your chalisti, and you, you're trying to dissolve within nature, this is where you're heading for, the nectar, right? In, in shamanistic practice, you, you, you want to dissolve within nature and take in all the sensory information that's available to you in the forest or up the mountain or in the river or in the sea or wherever you are, Take it all in equally. Don't be judgmental about it. Just take it all in and allow it to permeate you, to become part of you and you to become part of it. And then you realize, of course, that you always were part of it. You just, your your upbringing, your, the, the things you've been taught through your life, the things you've learned have separated it from you, not in reality, but just in your own head. Again, it's all in your head you realize that you were never separated from it in the first place. You just thought you were. All of that change, ongoing change, is a dance of energy. It's a dance. And this is why, so you, you think of the incoming being the sensory information coming into a shaman in a deep state of chelicity, taking it all in, not filtering it, not judging it, just taking it all in, which is one of the reasons why shamans can do things that ordinary people can't sometimes, because they have access to a much richer store of nature energy, nature information coming into them from energy. But then there's the outgoing. How do you express your energy back out into the world as part of that ongoing weave and when you start to learn, for instance, spirit dance, you're dancing around and you're all doing it under your own steam. But what you find through your practice through a long period of time is you're not leading nature and nature not leading you. It's one thing. It's one thing that's giving rise to the dance. And as I said, this is why the drum's so popular in shamanism, because those cues when you're out in the forest, they're very, very subtle. The terpenes and the rustling of the leaves the, and the... You know, the energy in the environment, the, the geology under the ground giving subtle changes to the feeling of the place and the the uh, flora and fauna and fungi and all this kind of stuff that are in the 
that complex, rich environment that is, you know, my favorite mixed deciduous woodland. I love that those places. All of that stuff is very delicate in general. Not all of it. You know, sometimes nature's really obvious and in your face. Thunder and lightning. There you go. You know, a volcanic yeah. eruption. Sometimes nature's in your face, but most of the time nature is super subtle. And it communicates to you through energy. But the key point with the popularity of the drum in shamanism is a drum is not subtle either. It's a like drum turning the volume is, up, isn't it? It's like amplification. Yes. And it just yeah. gives you, it can be used in so many different ways, which we went through in the Gathering of the Tribe. We went a bunch of different ways to use the drum. And um, it's, it's such a brilliant tool because it gives you the sense of being open to those vibrations, to those energy patterns that are coming out of the drum uh, that have been caused by the dance or whatever, whatever technique you're doing with the drum. And we, we spend quite a bit of time on the gathering of the tribe using the drum like a like a ultrasound, like to scan the body, um, mm. to get those waves to permeate into the body, to, to make a sense, to get a sense of what's going on inside the body. This is Amska practice, right? Uh, light, lightweight observation of self or lightweight understanding of the changes because as a shaman you want to understand nature and the closest part of the nature to you is your body and so that's where you start that's what Amska is all about yeah but level the, two yeah but you can think of all the different tools that shamans use and they are myriad all over the world but this one people keep coming back to and I kind of realized myself during the gathering of the tribe just why the drum is so universally popular in shamanism. It's a big hitter. The, the patterns that it's making are not subtle. So for a beginner's tool, for a shamanic beginner's tool, there's nothing really better than a drum or biscuit tin or whatever it is, you know, the, yeah. because it's so immediate. You can get, get going with drum technique really, really easily. And, um, and it, immediately gives you the sense. I mean, anybody can pick up, you know, you hit the drum and you put it right in front of your chest. Anybody can pick up on those vibrations that go into your, for instance, the cavities of the lungs. Anybody can pick up on that. And so that's, I think, the reason. It's not that the idea that shamans use drums spread all around the world by one shaman talking to another shaman and teaching him how to make a drum. I really feel that it's parallel evolution. I think that in different places in the world, shamans have been practicing within nature and they've been looking to use tools to facilitate that practice. It's probably the why drum the drum has, was um, one of, if not the very first instrument. To the yeah, the drum has bubbled to the top of that pile. It is yeah. a super useful tool for a shaman, but far from the only one. Far, far from the only one. Um. So coming back to the animism versus shamanism. Does, does, does every every shamanic, uh, quote-unquote, culture around the world uh, have, have drum in some capacity? As, as far as I'm aware, mate, as far as I'm aware, um, it wow. seems to be very hard to stop shamans from making drums. Uh, they, but the only thing that would stop them is they live in a place where they literally can't get any materials that they can make any drum-like object out of. <laughs> I think that's going to be quite yeah. difficult. But I, I haven't really seen it. Uh, there may be something that's, you know, it, it may be not what we would call traditionally a drum, maybe a hollowed piece of wood or something like that, but it's being used like a drum. Something that you can just bang. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, it's, not, and... it's not just that. That's, that's not the key. The key is something that can impart energy mm. vibrations, energy into you or into the environment for you, for your sh for the purposes of whatever shamanic technique that you're uh, doing. It's not so much, I mean, people talk about the rhythm and I love the band The Shaman and Terence McKenna and all that stuff. But to a certain extent, it's n the rhythm is useful in some shamanic technique. I mean, for instance, just simply achieving a state of chelicity, just a regular rhythm could put you into that, you know, put you into that kind of, State or that you've called a trance before. You know, I don't like the word trance, but I know, you know, I know what you mean. I was, I was about yeah, to yeah. use that word because I have experienced <laughs> yes. it, but I will not yes. use it again. But my point <laughs> is that that's far from the only kind of technique that a drum is useful for. Well, you can do that with anything repetitive, right? It's not necessarily yes. just the drum. It's, it's but something my point is there are techniques in shamanism that use non-repetitive, non-rhythmic sound, yeah. and they are totally legitimate. We did some of them on the, on the Gathering of the Tribe. So I, I really think that the, 
the drum as a non-subtle uh, substitute for natural energy patterns or an introductor. It's like the drum is your instructor for natural energy patterns and teaches you how to pick up on them. And then when you come to something far less subtle than a drum, like a deciduous woodland, you've learned the idea of how to pick up on these things using your body as a kind of radar for nature and your dance, your spread dance as a radar for nature. And, you know, and indeed in drum technique, using the environment, the movement of a branch or a leaf to determine how you're striking the drum or how the drum is struck and how the energy. And then you become like a, a leaf le relay or a branch relay as the drummer. You're not deciding what the rhythm is. The tree is and the wind is and the environment is. This is uh, why it's such a wonderful, wonderful thing. Coming back to the shamanism versus animism. It's very simple. They are the same thing. They are absolutely the same thing. The only difference is the desire or determination on the part of the shaman. If I'm interested in, I think I've said this analogy before, but here's an analogy. I'm interested in cars or I like cars. I used to like them when I was young. I have no interest in them anymore. The only, the only thing that interests me about a car is that it doesn't break down. That's that's my main <laughs> interest. So I'm an animist of cars. You know, I might like a car to take me from here to Cambridge, which my little Toyota does on a, on a you know, regular basis and back again. But I'm not a car enthusiast. I'm not a car enthusiast in terms of, you know, like I used to when I was very young, I used to have a picture of like a Lamborghini on my wall or something. I'm talking about when I was a kid, you know, something like that. I'm not an enthusiast on that level but that kind of an enthusiast that would be if if you take substitute the car for nature that would be an animist but a shaman is the mechanic yeah the shaman's the guy who wants to understand everything about how that car works how the engine works how the transmission works how the electrics work all that kind of thing which is not the average person really not the average person so the mechanic is to the car what the shaman is to nature and the animist is to the car, what the car enthusiast is to the car, Does that, to, to nature, sorry, what the yeah. animist is to nature. Yeah, that's the kind of analogy that I've used in the past. Uh, a shaman has a desire to apply technique to go deep, to really go deep with what nature, to take nature as their teacher and to go deep. Whereas... If you like, an animist simply wants to take nature not as their teacher, but as their delighter. And nature has a huge capacity to delight and inspire and um, enliven people. Just a colossal. Miki called this Yoki Yusan. Yoki means the sort of positive energy that a child has while they're running through the mountains chasing butterflies. Um, nature yeah. has a tremendous capacity for that. And we see that. In modern society, I think a lot of things, because of the, the increased communication that the internet's brought, people are starting to see through the kind of miasmatic brainwashing that perhaps our parents' generation got from the, I'm not saying we don't get it, but from the government uh, in our respective countries and culture in our respective countries. They used to believe that stuff more because they just saw one thing. I'm not saying that the brainwashing doesn't still work. It absolutely does. But we, um, I guess, I've seen so many different takes on things, or especially on yeah. the internet, since the rise of the internet, that we've become a bit jaded with some things. You know, for instance, lockdown uh, that happened a while ago. Some people can see some aspects of that that may have been, you know, may have been it may have been dealt with badly and um but one of the things that i think was positive came out of that time period was that there used to be this idea that you needed a job this was something from my parents generation you needed a job and when you were choosing between jobs you know do i want to be an astronaut or do i want to be a doctor or do i want to be a i don't know a merchant or something like that you're kind of choosing between jobs or even within one field, within, say, IT field, do I want this programmer's job or this programmer's job, even two similar jobs, which one do I want? And I think what a lot of people came out of that experience feeling, it's that's not the choice. Do I want that programmer job, that programmer job, or perhaps they're both crummy and I want no job at all. 
And I think that kind of thing, that kind of thing that perhaps there are other ways to live your life or, you know, any job's better than the one I've got or anything is better than one. Of, looking at different aspects, and I also remember the whole thing is that, that it also cured was like, there used to be endless discussions because, you, know, you know, I've been also steeped in agile for a long time. But I said, oh, we can't trust and people. What, sorry? To agile. Oh, agile. We, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can't. We can't trust people to work from home. That would be, used to be a conversation I used to have with my fellow, um, should we say, managers, leaders, whatever you want to call them, on a regular yeah. basis. We can't trust people to work from home. They're not trustworthy. Some people you can trust, but we have to have one size fits all and we can't trust everybody. Uh, they'll be slacking off. Well, lockdown, give the lie to that. Um, I saw productivity at Cambridge, certainly. I saw productivity shoot up. Uh, as we went through lockdown, not down. Everybody, without exception, it turned out, could be trusted to work from home. And um, and that, thankfully, that awful, awful Rain Nancy pseudo-management argument has gone out the window now, and I haven't heard it for a long time. So there's another positive thing that's come out of that's come out of lockdown and, and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So we are natural animals and i think i'm not saying there's anything wrong with us the society we've built but i do think in gaining something in gaining our technology in gaining our medicine and stuff and, and all that kind of things all the, the learning and the you know for instance, scientific understanding of the universe and all this kind of stuff which is great and so i'm certainly not one of those people who say we should ditch all of that far from it it's great we did lose something as well. We lost this closeness to nature. We lost this th sense that we are part of the entire weave of the universe. The, the universe is me and I am the universe. And that we participate within these energy patterns in ways that we that we that feel natural to us. And given that those energy patterns are ongoing, are an ongoing pattern of change an ongoing dance or weave that extends throughout all time into the future and into the past. We are dancers. We are spirit dancers. We naturally. And again, you find me some shaman somewhere who don't dance, you know, it, it, because what does the dance do? It involves energy changes. It's a physical representation of the weave that goes on within, it, within nature. And gradually, as you learn more and more, uh, shamanic technique more and more you, so you progress further and further with shaman technique it then becomes a radar for nature you can make the patterns that the dance is producing interact with and cross over the patterns that nature is producing and then you gradually as you progress through level 4 level 3 and level 4 and level 5 as you run through th those sort of progressions in the path to be God's becoming a shaman you find that you like to be part of the dance. You don't want to make the decisions about where the dance is going. Nature is guiding you. Nature is taking the lead and you are just simply following. And that is the wonder in spirit dance. It's the wonder in drum technique. It's a wonder in every other type of shamanistic technique. Obviously, spirit dance is the one I've done the most time on. And just allowing nature to speak through you to not speak let's say allowing nature to sing through you through your movement is something that can even within these crazy societies that we've built with their crazy ideas you know all these political things left wing and right wing we had an election recently in the uk and i thought Left wing and right wing, the carbon copies of each other, these two things. How can they be different wings, you know? Um, but yeah. the, um, the, the key point is that we can come back to nature. This idea of an archaic revival, we've tried it twice over. We did, I mean, we, our generation, have tried it twice over. We did it during the 90s with a sort of superficial way. Hey, let's all dress up in hippie gear and listen to the shaman and you know, um, you know, he's a good. It's Ebenezer good. Um, do raves and all that kind of thing. Which a rave is a kind of spirit dance, right? You know. Yep, yep. I was um, going to say that. Very yep. animistic. And very it's interesting animistic. that the drum um, 
I was going to say as well, it's interesting that the drum is um, is still something that's that pervades mo- that's in, inside modern music. Absolutely. Can you of, imagine? Of all genres. All genres, yes. Can you imagine music without the drums? Um, it's. I know there is music that doesn't have drums, uh, like chamber music and stuff like that, but but yeah, there's something missing. <laughs> there's something missing <laughs> in that like, music. <laughs> but to be fair, the strings, you know the strings as well, those stringed instruments, yeah. I, you know, I've, I've never met anybody who's shamanistic enough who's into that stuff to do it. But I know that you can. I know there could be a creative violin academy. I know that it's entirely possible um, to stand alongside Joe's Creative Piano Academy. I know that that kind of thing would be possible. Just have to find somebody who's into doing something like that. The yeah. um, maybe maybe Joe. I don't know how good you are at violin, Joe. Or you know, never touched one something. in my life. <laughs> okay, so we might, I might give be it a, a go. Bit of a stretch. Yeah, I could, uh, I could use it as a as a as a shamanic technique. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, but what are the strings doing? They're putting vibrations out. They're doing they're exactly vibration. what the drummer yeah, is. Yeah, they're yeah. creating. But, but it's the same with the guitar, energy. right? Because one yeah, thing, yeah. one thing that I feel when I play the guitar is the vibration of the strings coming through the guitar. Now, obviously, yeah. I'm not in a state of chillisty when I'm playing the guitar. Um, mm. Although I, I suppose I could be, but uh, but I'm. If it would be a different affair if I was playing the guitar in a state of chillicity, but I can definitely feel those vibrations coming through the guitar into me. And, and I'll give you something else, uh, something to think about. You can feel when nature has influenced music, and even in a really, really, what I would consider a constrained genre like classical music, like um, or modern, uh, what they call it, the Romantic movement. What I don't mean like. Um, when I say romantic, I don't mean Duran Duran. I mean Beethoven and those guys, you know, uh, the who kind of invented that movement. The um, when you listen to composers like Sibelius, for instance, mm-hmm. uh, Karelia, the Karelia Suite, he's in a very, very stifled genre, a very a, a, a genre with rules and 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 you know a, a huge miasmatic culture behind it that determines forms and everything. But you can still feel the fact that that guy was inspired by nature coming through that music when you listen to it. Um, and this is how yeah. strong nature is. And 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 you probably couldn't explain why. I, I, I would, just to, just, I'm just getting on yeah. my high horse for one second. And yeah, I would yeah. argue that the Romantic period was probably the pinnacle of music achievement. And then it all went downhill in the 20th century when they all started <laughs> banging table legs with trying, it, it, you know, it wasn't yeah. particularly the, the finest yeah. moment. But I think my favourite period of music is the Romantic period, I, I think, I think it, because it yeah. was so, uh, for me, unconstrained. It's like um, it's all relative, isn't it? It's all relative. Yeah. Uh, I was using the term constrained only relative to me going around the stones, banging my drum seemingly at random. <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, but yeah, it's uh, certainly that music. So anybody who hasn't come across Sibelius, uh, some of his music is very, very nature inspired, um, wonderful. Marla's, Marla's another fifth, one. Marla's ninth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. What I'm going to is that there's an impetus towards participation within the weave of nature. And the weave is the energy threads that extend throughout all time. And one of the things that I found is wonderful about shamanism and being part of this ancient, ancient, how do you call it a tradition? A tradition suggests that it's handed down from one person to another, and sometimes it is. It's developed independently in different areas of the world. So is it really a tradition? It's hard to say. But the evolution, the ongoing evolution, that is the shaman's desire to participate as part of nature, to dissolve within nature, that is something that we can definitely learn from and we need. And it, and the, the way to do that, ways that you can do that, we've been talking about on this podcast for a long time. So I thought it was worth, at this point in time, or we on episode 70-something, it might be worth mentioning that, using an episode to mention what it is we're trying to do here. We're trying mm. to show ways in which somebody can become a dancer within the dance of the universe, the energetic dance of the universe. And you know I'm using the term dance both literally in terms of spirit dance, but also um, figuratively in terms of the dance of the energy threads that go on in all types of shamanic technique. 
Uh, and that's why woven energy, that's where the term was selected originally. And I think maybe now that we've got through to some level four episodes and we're going to do more, there's more to come, probably the very next episode will be another at level four episode. Then maybe we've built a foundation where people can get a grasp of what we were thinking back then or what we were feeling back then when Joe bullied me into doing this podcast. Um, and I'm glad that he did because it's turned out it's turned out to exceed my wildest expectations in terms of engaging people in shamanism. I also want to shout out to the people who joined Gathering of the Tribe 24. Um, in terms of their ability, a bunch of those guys, you, uh, it, it's on just on camera, I can see them doing their dancing around and using their drums and stuff. There's a bunch of those guys have have developed a substantial amount of shamanic ability mm. in just through listening to a podcast. Um, absolutely yeah. amazing. Oh, very well done, guys, by the way. I, and I, I really wouldn't, when we started, I really wouldn't have believed that that was possible. Um, but apparently it is. Um, amazing, amazing. Well, there's a draw to shamanism. There's a, there's a pull to it. And, That's um, for sure. The podcast is a vehicle. Uh, well, it's it's... You know, when we started, if we'd, we'd enthused 10 people about shamanism, I would have been absolutely delighted. I'm just looking down the list of patrons that we've got. Um, we're around, the, I don't know exactly what it is, but we're around the 100 mark. We're getting on for 100 uh, in one way or another. So that's 10 times the maximum level of effectiveness I thought <laughs> uh, that I thought this podcast would ever have. And the, the downloads are insane. Downloads are absolutely insane uh, in terms of numbers. Uh, amazing. Yeah. So, would it be correct in in a simplistic way if we were, if I was to wrap up this idea, is that we have lost the ability? <laughs> okay, this is Joe speak. We've lost the ability to see the world through these energy changes, and the shamanic techniques are a way for us to gradually develop the ability to um, to be able to feel, see interact with the the um, yes. woven energy and, and the tapestry of the energy changes that are within nature. And the shamanic techniques is what unlocks that for us uh, as, as That's quote, the quote, exercises. But there's one, or, there's one thing beyond that. So you said all the things you said were right. They unlock mm. us, the ability for us to perceive, to make energy changes ourselves through our shamanic technique to perceive the energy changes within nature. But there's a step beyond that, which is the dissolve within nature, which is where you're yeah. going as a shaman. You want to be fully a, a full participant within the dance of the universe, but you want to be, ultimately the goal is to become an undifferentiated participant, so that, that you kind of goes away. Um, and then, or, or becomes bigger. There's two ways. One is to see that the you, the miasmatic you goes away. But the actual you becomes bigger. The you that's you is just you that's the universe. Um, that's just a natural part of this amazing pattern of change. And why it's like this, who knows? Did someone make it like this? Did somebody, did something make it like Some principles, some inherent properties of the way that things can be, make it like this. Who knows? But what I'm very grateful for is the complexity. You will never get bored with shamanism. That's the one thing. The one yeah. thing that's just impossible. What you will feel instead is there aren't enough lifetimes. That's what I feel. You just my you need the tools to unlock technique. it for you. Yeah. It's you, it's so rich. It's so deep. It's so broad. Its scope is all encompassing. You will never run out of things to learn, things to experience, uh, new things to do. And I think if you lived a thousand years, you'd, you'd still be in the same situation. You'd be thinking a thousand years is nowhere near enough uh, yeah. to get fully to the bottom of this stuff. But the little opportunity that I've had in my life to experience it has been fabulous and very happy to encourage others to follow suit in whatever way they find comfortable, enjoyable. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Damon, probably brings us uh, 
yeah. neatly and roundly to uh, to the end of the episode. Is there anything else you want to say? No, just to say that we will do probably a highly technical level four episode for the next one, since this one's been Excellent. a bit general. And we've got another, we've got a uh, an interview to uh, to look forward to as well. Once you've yeah, edited that, that's right. That's right. Fantastic. Cool. Well, uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can support us over on patreon.com slash woven energy and you can get hold of the videos over there, I presume, Damon, for the uh, gathering of the tribe. Yeah, they're Those not all there. available for Patreons. As, as usual, I've been a bit Zara. lax, but yeah. Yeah, as, as usual, last year's are there, yeah, but as usual, I've been a bit lax getting them up. But some of them are there and they will all be there shortly. Great. Yep, so... Uh, Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thanks, guys. Bye.